ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming in this midweek, in the midst of your busy lives, in this big city. I think many of you may have to travel half an hour or more to come here. Is it on this? Yeah, I was just in Atlanta. Same thing. Huge cities spread out. Thank you also for uh, making this beautiful project. I wasn't aware that. Such a major project is underway. Uh, presumably, this is all under the inspiration of Shri Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. Is that correct? Yeah. So, congratulations to you all for continuing uh, in his physical absence. The the impetus that he uh, gave rise to. I remember listening. I, I I've listened to many recordings of his lectures, and uh, w- one point he made which struck a chord with me. He said that one of the the one of the occupational hazards of being a guru in Iskon is a bad back <laughs> due to sitting on soft biasasans. But I get around that by. Not if it's soft, I don't sit on them. So if you're wondering why I'm sitting down here, it's not due to humility, <laughs> but just because I don't want to have a bad back. <laughs> I don't have any uh, problem with sitting on big seats, but if they're soft, I don't because then you get a pain in your back. Anyway, let's talk about something uh, of more <coughs> import than bad backs. Well, that's also part of. Every, actually, everything comes in the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. People are, nowadays, devotees often ask me to speak about Bhakti Siddhanta, and I say, well, that's all we speak about anyway, because if, we always speak on Bhakti Siddhanta. It's all, everything we speak is the philosophy of devotional service. So, bad backs comes within it. Janma Mrityu Jaravyadhi Dukado Shanu Darshanam. Bhakti Siddhanta means to see everything in the light of the philosophical understanding of devotional service. So, bad back means, yeah, it's just part of being in this material world. There are no bad backs in the spiritual world. Or if there are, there may be just to, for some purpose of Krishna's, some purpose of his lila shakti, by which his pastimes are enacted. Anyway, this evening I wanted to speak on a topic that I had intended to speak on in Atlanta, which is where I just came from, uh, but which is uh, relevant to our movement, not only in Atlanta. Uh, it has been a subject of discussion for several years. Uh, but I, I want to take it from the other side is sometimes the topic is the ethnicization or deethnicization of ISKCON. In other words, should it be Indianized or not? And I want to take it from a somewhat different angle that actually uh, India is very important. It's essential to our movement, the, the or rather Indian culture which is the the origin of Indian culture is Krishna and the spiritual world because Krishna appears in India, Rama appears in India and the, the culture that we have received through our Acharyas and specifically through Srila Prabhupada is based on that culture. It's inseparable from Krishna conscious because although Krishna is not an Indian, and we are not Indians. 
But that culture of kirtan, puja, arati, the very idea of offering food to God, that is Indian culture and the, the, the dress, the food style and everything about it, the interactions, how uh, people deal with each other according to their position in life, the social hierarchy. It could be called Indian. Actually, it's spiritual, but in this world it's particularly manifested in India. Mm. Now, of course, there are many traditional cultures all over the world which have many uh, facets which are similar to those in Indian culture. But specifically, uh, only in India, or particularly in India, is Krishna, known as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Actually, deities of Vedic deities have been found all over the world. Ancient Vedic deities have been unearthed all over the world. But this this kind of information is forbidden archaeology. It's not it's not uh, publicized. And in the uh, in in places of the world which haven't yet become McDonaldized and Coca Colaized. Uh, there's in where there's still traces of the ancient culture. You'll find all over the world the uh, Krishna consciousness. Uh, God brother of mine who lives in Bulgaria sent me some translations of Bulgarian folk songs, which were common uh, until the communist era there. And they're still known in Bulgarian society, speaking about uh, a young boy who takes out his cows and plays on his flute, who's also the supreme lord of everything, and also lies on an ocean in a massive form on an ocean of milk, lying on a snake bed. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> And there are things like that all over the world. But particularly, uh, that culture has has been particularly cultivated in the land which we nowadays call India. Which, it, it's a political entity, uh, but beyond being a political entity, it is a cultural entity. The, the concept of Bharata was made as a unified political entity, uh, and then again broken up by the British. But the concept of Bharata as a cultural entity is there in Puranas, in the common saying, the, uh, what is that, uh, Ahimachala Setu Bandha, from the Himalayas to Setu Bandha, where the, the place where, in South India where uh, Lord Rama built his bridge, to go to Lanka. So that area, and the, the area where the, the nine sacred rivers uh, with the la- flow, where the, the land of rishis, of, co- of course, um, that now broken up, the one, that, the river from which the name India gets the name, the Sindhu River, is no longer a place of rishis and holy baths because that's gone into Pakistan. Uh, but the, the broader area was there, uh, Afghanistan, all these towns, right up to Tatarstan in Russia, and then on the eastern side, that was the, the, what is Indochina, uh, Indonesia, they all, it's, that culture was there until recently. Uh, Malaya, until recently, that was, uh, was all Indian culture. The Garuda Airways is the uh, airways of Indonesia, Indonesia. Uh, Caspian Sea, that's said to be from Kashyap. You know anyone called Kashyap? Your spiritual brother, who uh, I know very well, of course, for many years. So uh, th- that Indian culture, was, but that was th- that culture was centered in the land which is now known as Bharat. It was a broader area. It's gradually by the 
influence of Kali Yuga becoming smaller. In Kali Yuga, all good things become less. Tatas, what is that? Tatas Chanu Dinam Raja. Satyam Shocham Kshamadaya Kalena Balinara Jannang Shantayo Balang Smritihi. In Kali Yuga, with the passing of every day, all good things become diminished. Dharma, Satyam, Dharma, how to translate that? Just say Dharma, it's easier. Satyam, truthfulness, Shocham, cleanliness, uh, Kshama, tolerance. Uh, satyam Shocham Shama Doya this mercy mercifulness then uh, Kalena Balina Ranja then uh, Ayu the length of lifespan bodily strength and mental strength these all decrease day by day so the land of India is becoming shrunk but uh, it is of importance to all devotees of Krishna. We can't deny that. All the, the holy places, of course now there are so many holy places, by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and his followers, even in this cow-killing country of, uh, of America, of which Texas is particularly cow-killing. Now India is full of cow-killing also. But in these unlikely lands, there are also holy places. But still, however many holy places are established, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's prediction is that every town and village, Priti Vite Achi Jata Nagaradi Gram Sabatra Pacha Hoibe Moranam, every town and village of the world, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's glories will be sung, and pre- presumably then the deity will also be established. Wherever the holy name is chanted is a holy place. But still, uh, Vrindavan, Navadvip, Puri, Badrinath, Nathwa, these all have their special significance, these holy places. So it, it is of concern to devotees that, for instance, the Yamuna is wholly polluted. It is of concern to the, to devotees that the government, uh, of Uttar Pradesh wants to build a massive highway with a bridge over the Yamuna and in this way uh, will, all, will further destroy the spiritual ambience of Vrindavan. These are issues of concern. Recently a book was published uh, called Breaking India which shows that there it, it's known but so much detail the authors have brought out to show how uh, various Christian groups and Muslim groups, they uh, have big plans for uh, converting more and more Hindus to their sectarian faiths, uh, and in this way to break the India as a political body and as a and to break the uh, cultural uh, unity. Of Hindus, and that, that this is a matter it should be a matter of concern for devotees in our movement. We may say, well, it's socio-political matters, but uh, definitely uh, in India, which Srila Pra India Srila Prabhupada put so much energy into, Srila Prabhupada famously came to the West and established Krishna consciousness. But having done so, he spent most of his time and energy in India uh, and he brought money from the West to establish projects in India he was, and he repeatedly said Bharata, he repeatedly quoted Bharata Bhumite Hoila Manusha Janmaja Janmashata Kari Koro Para Upaka that Indians in particular uh, should preach Krishna consciousness so the and, and Srila Prabhupada he was concerned. He kept in touch with the news in India. Who's the, the, the when the government changed to the uh, Moraji Desai government? What was that the Jan, Janasang? Was it the Janata Party? No, at that time it wasn't Janasang. It was the Janasang that that later split into the BJP and the Janata Dal. 
at that time was the Jana song, I believe. I can't. But anyway, the point was, Srila Prabhupada, he took interest because there was, they were supposed to be more interested in Hindu matters. And that later the BJP came out of that. Srila Prabhupada, when, um, not that Srila Prabhupada was what we call a Hindutvavadi, but he was concerned with these matters. This, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpai, he regularly came to our center in Juhu. Of course, the temple was only open just shortly after Srila Prabhupada left. But he used to come and appreciate, which not so many people did in those days. And he wasn't a very big man at that time, but Srila Prabhupada said, feed him every time, give him prasadam. Because in the future he'll be a very important man. And of course, later on he became the Prime Minister of India. And he took the... Uh, step, which was quite a bold step for a politician, of uh, he came forward to inaugurate our temple in Delhi, the Iskon temple. It was quite a, you know, for a politician to do that, it's, it's like I say, it's quite a bold step. And, and that attracted international news attention and really showed to the world that uh, our movement is, at least in India, accepted by the highest uh, elite and he, at the opening he said I used to in the days when I didn't have any proper arrangement for eating even I used to go to the Iskon temple and they, I used to take prasadam very nicely there so you see Prabhupada knew so <laughs> um, and when there was the uh, 1971 attack of Pakistan on India and uh, a reporter asked Prabhupada that, you know, should we, should, should the Indian army fight? Should they resist? Because at that time, the, uh, the influence of Mahatma Gandhi and his ideas were very strong. Now, Mahatma Gandhi's ideas have been almost totally eclipsed. But at that time, when I first went to India to stay, I first went in 76, but later I went to stay in 77, and more or less I've been there ever since. Uh, still, there were many people who had Mahatma Gandhi's picture on their altar and said he's an avatar. Nowadays, you don't, you won't find anyone. But his that idea of ahimsa was his in, his misinterpretation of the Bhagavad Gita that that it's Bhagavad Gita is meant to preach ahimsa uh, and Nehru rather hypocritically promoted this non-intervention and. Uh, non-alignment and although anyway I don't want to get too much into politics so I'm also somewhat aware of it Srila Prabhupada in, I'm making the point that Srila Prabhupada took a lot of interest in what goes on in India because he considered it so important so the the newspaper reporter asked Prabhupada that, well should we resist what do you think and Prabhupada said yes certainly we should should resist Pakistan and Prabhupada said that because we did our Pandal program in Delhi just prior to that, therefore the Indian forces were able to quickly resist and destroy the Pakistani forces. So I'm just making the point that Srila Prabhupada, although he was completely transcendental, he always preached uh, this uh, Bhoma Idjadhi Sa Eva Go Kara. I won't quote the whole verse, but one who thinks of uh, his land of birth as worshipable is like a, no more intelligent than a cow or an ass. So Srila Prabhupada certainly had no mundane attachment to India because he had no mundane attachment to anything. He was completely attached to Krishna. But he was particularly concerned about India because that is the land into which Krishna personally comes and that land is mentioned in the Shastra that that the demigods, they want to take birth in India because it is the best place for spiritual advancement, for developing Krishna consciousness. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada considered it very important. And we see that in our Krishna consciousness spreading throughout the world, that uh, although at that time in India, when Srila Prabhupada was personally present, hardly any Indians were actually joining our movement. They, they, it took them some time to adjust to the, the fact that Westerners were becoming devotees. They couldn't 
quite work it out, it seems. But now we see that with Indians spread in throughout most of the world, in many places in the world, at least we can see, that they tend to take an interest and they're actually taking up the practices of Krishna consciousness as we see here today that uh, here in this temple all the uh, proportion of Indian bodied attendees is significantly more than the proportion of Indians in the city of Houston. It means the, the Indians are taking more interest because it's then it's the natural culture that they're raised with. So we we should be concerned, as I said, with issues like the Yamuna being polluted, with the political situation in India. Uh, n- not that we may get involved directly in politics, as Baba Ram Dev is doing at the present time. I don't. Is that coming in the American press? Is it? Yeah. Is it? I I just read the uh, Hindu published in Chennai daily, so I don't know. But uh, how do they represent it? How do they represent? How does the New York Times represent it? Generally, the press in the West is, uh, and and everyone, the, the the academia, it's all like anti, at least subtly anti-Indian, and presenting India everything Indian as inferior, like and the Indians themselves believe it. Including all of you. Uh, just like in this book, Breaking India, they, the authors made the very pertinent comment that in the West, in the media, if there's a riot, they report it like it's an aberration. You know what aberration means? It means a deviation from the norm. That actually Westerners are very civilized and you know, sometimes there's a riot. It's probably the blacks. And... Uh, but if in India or Africa there's a riot, they present, well, that's just normal for them. That's the, that's the kind of tone that they're un, this whole idea that the Westerners went to, they went, they justified it. We're going all over the world to civilize the people and they're still doing it. We're going in Afghanistan because the women have to wear burqas and we want, we want them to wear mini skirts and so. <laughs> and, and, and come to, you know, we, for our striptease clubs we need, so. They present that we've, we're going there to civilize them. And uh, propaganda is very powerful. And even the Indians believe it. And although although uh, India has the actual civilization, which Srila Prabhupada wanted to spread all over the world, the Indians, uh, they themselves, many of them, they, they feel ashamed of it. I said to one of my disciples in Gujarat, he's always coming to the temple in pants and sh- you know like this uh, uh, so I said to you at least when you come to the temple wear a dhoti so I, he didn't say anything to me but later I said heard that uh, he said to someone I don't want to look like a guala guala means a cowherd caste so he he presumes himself superior actually we want to be guala right Krishna <laughs> Krishna's the uh, that's the caste he chooses to appear. Even the whole idea of caste is it's not an Indian concept, it's a British concept. The the Indian concept is Varnashram. So uh, this book Breaking India actually shows so many things how how the Indian psyche has become permeated with ideas invented by Westerners to undermine the whole Indian culture. So, uh, yeah, we should be concerned about this as devotees of Krishna. Of course, here in America, there are many other, we could say, more immediate concerns, like bringing Krishna consciousness to the American people. But uh, there are many points of broader culture. Uh, actually, everything. The, the Krishna conscious movement is supposed to uh, bring pure spiritual culture to the world and uh, in this way it covers everything. Krishna covers everything. Sarvam samap noshi, Arjuna says to Krishna, you cover everything. So Krishna conscious covers everything. 
that doesn't mean that we're going to get directly involved in ecological movements and uh, stop the cow slaughter movements. We do that in our... Srila Prabhupada wanted to do all these things, but within the scope of Krishna consciousness. Yes, we have our protect the cow movements. We have our farm communities, our ecological movement, farm ki- is farm communities. So we do that all within the scope of Krishna consciousness. But at the same time, we uh, definitely uh, we sympathize with and we, we see it as a positive sign that people are becoming vegetarians, they are accepting the concept of reincarnation, they are uh, perceiving the cheating of governments. These are things that Srila Prabhupada spoke about. So, if people uh, start to uh, take up these principles, then uh, that means that, uh, maybe indirectly, that the message that Srila Prabhupada is preaching is, is having an effect. And it is, actually, in many ways. I, I was on a plane recently, going from Delhi to London, and there was uh, an elderly... English Sikh woman preaching to the young man who had just spent a few months in India who was sitting next to me and she was sitting on the next seat the other way. Later she fell asleep and I preached him and he forgot everything she said. But I just noticed in their conversation they were using terms like spiritual master, pure devotee. These are all terms coming from Srila Prabhupada's books. So, in many ways, Srila, that we we don't we may not even recognize that Srila Prabhupada's books and his movement are having a, a deep effect on the culture all over the world. There was something else I saw a few years ago uh, on the on a newspaper. There was a, 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 cap, a photo caption and something about the Chechen people. They're traditionally Chechen, I guess they're called that traditionally considered rascals. And that usage of the word rascals is Prabhupada's usage. <laughs> because prior to that, the word... Well, it's it's was an anachronistic usage, which has again become current, because the word rascal in modern English had come to mean not such a bad person. It's, it's almost like, like uh, fun. How can you say... Mm, mischievous, something like that, yeah. Uh, but in in the former usage, which it, it again become current, it seems, due to Prabhupada's usage of it, it, it means someone who's seriously misbehaved. So like that. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, yeah, I, we're, and as... Preachers of Krishna consciousness, uh, we we are, should also be cognizant of these trends, uh, and give people the uh, the full holistic spiritual dimension on them all. What is the ecological? What is the solution to all the ecological problems? Become Krishna conscious. What is the solution to? cow slaughter, become Krishna conscious, how to increase vegetarianism, become Krishna conscious. All these things will, auto, everything will come automatically with Krishna consciousness. So, uh, yeah, uh, we should be aware of this and uh, of all these issues uh, as we present Krishna consciousness as the solution to all world problems. But as Srila Prabhupada was, um, devotees of Krishna all over the world should also have concern for the spiritual and even social health or, uh, or even political health of India. You may say, well, what can we do about it? Well, uh, at least concern should be there and, uh, and uh, to support the preaching efforts in India. 
uh, Srila Prabhupada himself put so much emphasis on that. Uh, that may be done by, uh, you may think I'm going to end this up with a pitch for building a, you know, give me some money. But actually I'm not, I'm talking on this on a, on a, uh, philosophical level. Uh, Srila Prabhupada also wanted very much that devotees from the West would go and spend time in India, at least to visit Mayapur and Vrindavan. So when they go, uh, they can, chant and dance and the Indian people will also take note of that. It's very, even today Srila Prabhupada wanted 500 devotees from the West to come and have residence permits in India. So he wanted very much that devotees from the West would come and preach and at least visit um, and in this way become, uh, Srila Prabhupada said, that by visiting Mayapur and bathing in the Ganga and performing kirtan with devotees in Mayapur, they would become purified from the effect of preach, uh, preaching in the sinful West, and then they could go back again back to preach. Those who are from India, and they, when they visit India, uh, they should also preach Krishna consciousness uh, among in whatever way they can, they can speak to whoever they can, because uh, Indians in India tend to respect those who've gone to America, because they have regard for the West, they think, because they're brainwashed by bogus propaganda, they think everything in the West is better, and anyone who's gone to the West, they must be a big man. So that can be used for preaching also. When you go, don't just visit relations and say hello to them. Give them Prabhupada's books. Tell them about the importance of human life. Uh, And uh, in this way, uh, contribute to the uh, Krishna conscious movement in India. Western devotees... They may not all be able to go and spend considerable time there. If they can, that's very good. But uh, even for the short time they're there, should visit from time to time the holy places. But they, if they can go and at least dance and chant in the streets and in, in programs, and that will have a tremendous impression. I first went to Bangladesh in 1979 that's a Muslim dominated country as you know there are many Hindus there also uh, the second largest Hindu population in the world after India and uh, one Hindu social worker uh, shortly after you went there one Hindu social worker told us that um, <clears throat> by our going around and doing programs western body devotees He said that the tendency for the Hindus to convert to Christianity, wherever you go, that completely stops. I think the Christians have more or less given up in Bangladesh now. Because our movement there has become very strong. Maybe more than in any other country, our movement is very well accepted among the Hindus. And even the Muslims are are respectful and appreciative. They're actually very religious people. You won't find an atheist in the whole country. <clears throat> so uh, yeah th- that effect is also there in India that actually we don't want I mean, although we're not Hindu we're not promoting Hinduism per se but it is better if people are Hindus than Muslims in as much as they'll be more open to and respectful of Krishna Bhagavad Gita whereas uh, when they become Christians, especially in India, they become very offensive, actually. And and it becomes very difficult to preach Krishna consciousness to them. Now, uh, on the other hand, here in the West, while we we do want to introduce... Let me make another point first. This is also another kind of culture, you can say. So... Srila Prabhupada sometimes spoke of cultural conquests. 
he pro he preached philosophically, uh, but he also spoke. Uh, it's not only philosophy; it's it's a whole way of life, or rather, the philosophy is integral integrally connected with the practices. So, in many ways, uh, the Krishna Conscious Movement appears to be an Indian movement. Definitely, Madanga cartels chanting the names of Krishna, wearing this kind of clothing is seen as Indian, although it's not, in in the higher sense, it's not Indian, it's Krishna's culture. You have that here in Houston, right? Krishna culture. Yeah. So, the, that we want to present, that real Krishna culture is Krishna. Krishna and Rama, not Sai Baba or Baba Ram Dave, although actually if you see his demands they're all pretty good actually. Uh, but the idea to that just overnight you'll rip corruption out of the country is not possible. Actually if you try to stop all the corruption immediately the whole economy would probably collapse <laughs> because it runs on black money, right? <laughs> but some of the uh, the, the real solution is for people to become Krishna conscious. Otherwise, corruption and exploitation must go on. But some of the things he says are good. Uh, I, this uh, One of his demands is that uh, education be con- uh, and governance be conducted on traditional Indian rather than Western systems. Uh, but it can't be done overnight, though, because where are the, where are the teachers to teach, even if you... Uh, to do that, where are the teachers to teach? You have to re re-educate everyone in the country, including all the teachers, and make people uh, amenable to that. And most of the, most of the or much of the population of India doesn't agree with that. So it's you can't just change it overnight. Although the idea is good, uh, all actually everything he says is good, or pretty much. Although he says to demonetize the uh, 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. But Prabhupada had a better idea altogether. Stop using paper money. <laughs> Actually, if you stop using paper money, then the, then the corruption will, to a large extent, stop also. Because paper money breeds corruption. I, I won't get into that, but Srila Prabhupada explained that. So, um, yeah, it is... Indian culture in one sense, uh, but on yeah, and so some devotees here in America, particularly, and have promoted an idea which has become it's entered the fabric of our movement that Christian consciousness is a science; it's not an ethnic religion. So, we should de-ethnicize it. And, uh, other, um, but that that argument has some validity. We don't want to promote this as... Although, in one sense it's Indian, we don't want to present it as just Indian, as if it's just some ethnic culture, like some, you know, Haitian voodoo, or, you know, every... every area has its own ethnic culture, Tibetan Buddhism, but rather this is the science of the absolute truth, but it is intricately and intimately linked with Indian culture, and we should present for this reason the uh, what appears to be Indian, there are so many trappings of that, although as Srila Prabhupada said, you can become Krishna conscious in a suit and tie, but at the same time we don't want the pujaris on the altar wearing a suit and tie. There, there are certain uh, there are certain facets of the culture which are best preserved. Uh, so, uh, and, and if, if they're not preserved, then much of the the practice of Krishna consciousness, or the, that which is pleasing to Krishna, will be lost. For instance, if we only offer pizza and ice cream to Krishna, then 
I don't know. He might not, he might run back to Vrindavan and get something, get something from his mother that he likes to eat. He has his own preferences and pizza, we don't find that mentioned in the, in Shastra. We find shuk, shukta shakadi bhaji nalita kushmanda dali dalna dugda tumbi dadhi mocha kanda. These, what you might call traditionally Indian preparations. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, that Indian culture, we can say that traditional Indian culture, it is significant, it is significantly superior to the modern American way of life. I don't think we, sh- we should give it too much credit by calling it a culture, anti-culture, or, or de- decultured, you could say. There's a, a serious lack of culture. Or as Srila Prabhupada said, dog and cat way of life. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to, I think this is the point that, that, the important point we can gain from this de-ethnicizing argument. We don't want to, uh, alienate people by presenting it as something just for Indians which uh, that can be a problem also because so I'm told I be I was told in at least one devotional community in America that there are three distinct or three distinct groups of devotees there's the Indians the blacks and the whites and they're all they all different and they don't interact with each other now, Srila Prabhupada said about the black, Afro-Americans or whatever, they always keep on changing the word. So, I grew up with blacks, and I'll say that with no, you know, derogatory or pejorative overtones. Um, Srila Prabhupada, he, he authorized that they, they could, a group of black devotees could open their own temple because he said, birds of a feather flock together. They have their own, subculture. So Srila Prabhupada wasn't against that as long as, you know, everyone cooperates together. But uh, but at the same time we have to be uh, careful not to separate, uh, be- become so separate or uh, that devotees are not all, to- all together. I mean, that's the whole idea, isn't it? That everyone should come together in Krishna consciousness. Now, since Srila Prabhupada passed away f- from this world, there has been a signif- Well, one thing is there's been a significant number of uh, Indians m- moving outside India. Previously, there, there were just a few in America, Canada, in England. Actually, there were quite a few moved to England from, from Africa when Prabhupada was present. But they hadn't... Now they're a socially prominent group. They came without... The Idi Amin, who expelled them from Uganda, he was kind enough not to kill them all. But he took even the nose rings out of the women. Every piece of gold, and he left them with their skins and their saris, and just the clothing on their back, literally. No one was allowed to bring anything. So they weren't socially prominent at the time, but they, they've come up now and they are socially a very uh, forward group, you would say, to use Indian terminolo- terminology. They've become, uh, due to business acumen and diligence, they've become uh, an, an important community in England. So the Indian uh, Hindu community, I'm especially speaking of, has become... Uh, widespread and 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 late, south indians many have come especially with the uh, i with the it revolution and they've become although numerically quite small quite a respected community in the west due to their uh 
performing at above uh, above average in business and uh, IT and fields requiring some education, uh, intelligence, and uh, and in this way becoming a socially forward community. Generally, uh, the income level is significantly higher than that of the average American. So, and uh, also for for their family values and general decency you could say you won't find them out on the streets drunk at, on saturday nights so uh some respect is there so those who are coming to krishna consciousness uh they can preach krishna consciousness here in the west and they they have a a, a platform to do so in as much as uh Western people or non-Indian, non-Hindu Americans, um, they they have some respect now for Indians. But uh, to the, the trick is how to uh, bring people to Krishna consciousness in a manner that they can feel. Uh, comfortable that they that they're not just joining an ethnic group or that, that they have to uh, immediately overnight completely change their culture and again for that it may require some separate space or some separate kind of preaching to them I know in uh, in Hong Kong which is you all know it's that was the preaching there was developed to a large extent again by Tamal Krishna Goswami. I don't know if they still do, but previously they used to have separate Sunday programs for the Indian and for the Chinese people. And in Zurich, where there are many uh, Sri Lankan Tamils, they have, again, they have two, two Sunday programs, one in Tamil and one in German or English or whatever. When I go, I speak in English. They, most people understand English also. So there may be like that, some separate consideration. Mahatattva Prabhu here, for the last several years. How many years have you been in San Diego? Six, seven, almost. Almost seven years. Has, has concentrated on preaching to... Uh, student age Western Americans with the aim of bringing them in to a serious commitment to Krishna consciousness in the Brahmachari ashram. And of course, not everyone becomes a Brahmachari, but many take it up seriously. So it, it requires, um, he's done that successfully. Uh, how many Brahmacharis do you have? About 15 Brahmacharis. So you may think, well, that's, if we go among the Indians, so many more will come. Well, that's true, but then why only to the Indians? The, the, the non-Indians should come also. Uh, it's, we could say it's relatively easier to bring in people of Indian background because they, they feel, uh, a cult, a, the, culturally an attraction to Krishna consciousness, but then Krishna consciousness is not meant only for the Indian, so uh, it's definitely not so easy to bring in people from a non-Indian background, a non-Hindu background, but that's uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement is meant for everyone. So, um, exactly how to, at which level of cultural acclimatization, how far, well that may be how how much we uh, demand or expect people to uh, take up what the, the cultural aspects that may be seen as Indian. Well, different preachers, they may uh, do so at different levels. Some advocate that, well, there's absolutely no need at all. Don't even mention it, that you need a dhuti or sari or something like that. I'm more on the other side, especially in India. 
that why why give up if you're going to take up this culture why not take it up fully but um for instance wearing dhoti or sari that helps us to ident although the identification of a devotee of krishna is not dependent on dress but it also helps us to feel that we are part of that role that we are we are part of krishna's family so uh, because that's the kind of clothing that krishna and his associates wear so i'm i'm more for that and certainly in kirtan uh, kirtan means for krishna's pleasure it's music but it's not for our pleasure so better keep it traditional and uh, krishna is the source of everything and if he wanted he could also in chaitanya mahaprabhu could have had electric guitars in his sankirtan but he didn't he had madangas and kartals and this uh, jaja this wampus we call it in english although it doesn't have to be wamped it can be played like this also and um, this uh, ghanta gong so these are the instruments which are pleasing to chaitanya mahaprabhu so considering that uh, everything should be done krishna de akhila cheshta everything should be done for krishna's sake therefore we try to do i try to promote that we should come to this level as far as possible we should everyone should come to the level of doing everything in a manner that is pleasing to krishna because that is bhakti although in a beginning stage especially people they may not understand this principle so we may be more lenient so there are some uh, general principles how they are applied we have to see uh, that that requires expert uh, preaching um, uh, every one who preaches they're given intelligence by krishna how to deal with different in, every individual is different there are no, although we say indian black white and all this there are no it's not that any one person is the same there may be different cultural groups but apart from dealing with groups we have to deal with every single individual but uh yeah the point that i'm making here is that yes we should be concerned with uh indian culture and uh part of our preaching that some more research could be done on that is as i was speaking in bulgaria and all over the world the what is the vedic culture was spread as shila prabhupad writes or actually bhagavatam says that that uh, parikshit maharaj his he ruled over the la- all the land bordered by the seas that means the whole world so the vedic culture was there everywhere so uh in a, that could be a point of research to show that how in different parts of the world the original culture was vedic and how this is the uh, superior culture which everyone can benefit from we're not we're not trying to make people indian per se jai hind or garv se kaho hum hindu hai or you know all that that's here also in america vhp saying garv se kaho hum say it with pride we are hindus but th- that's not our preaching our, our preaching is everyone should serve krishna come to krishna's lotus feet surrender to krishna uh, but that is intimately linked with uh, what is nowadays seen as uh, indian culture what exactly the indian culture is we have to separate the real from the unreal just like we don't want to spread bollywood films all over the world bollywood is indian films hindi films specifically i mean there are also tamil films telugu films bengali films and, uh so that and and, and sai baba you know that's we definitely don't want to spread that at all 
uh, but the, the, the original culture uh, by, by which Srila Prabhupada wanted to bring in a, a revolution, uh, the, no need for all these big cities and all these uh, live simply on the land. Well, how are we going to do that? We don't have the culture, and then the culture should be the, the Vedic culture. So it's a big task. Srila Prabhupada said that I wanted to establish Varnasham Dharma. 50% of my work isn't done. You see what Prabhupada did. That was a miracle what Prabhupada did. So it's a big task. But it is a task given to all his followers. So we should not forget that or minimize that. Hare Krishna. That's all I'll say now unless there are questions or comments. Is this building sloping? It appears to be sloping slightly this way. Is it? Is that? Is it? Does anyone know? Do you have any structural engineers here? Yeah? Uh, there was a BTG article years ago said that in Houston it's not only the roof that's sliding because there's some stadium here with a sliding roof. Is it? So maybe this is sliding down also. Yeah, you have a Someone has a question? Yeah, okay. Do we have an extension mic, cordless mic? Oh, yeah, you can. Good. It's good acoustics, well designed. Two, two points uh, in support of the things you said about how Indians' minds have been corrupted. I live in India. You live in India? Yes. Where do you live, Mataji? In Vrindavan. You live in Vrindavan? Yes. When, you when did you first go to Vrindavan? 86, okay. I first went in 76. What a difference between now and the, oh now and then. It's, yeah. Why Indians have been corrupted when you speak to educated Indians, I always have to correct them because when they speak about deities, they say idols. Yeah, and there's another point. They say, they don't say deities, they say idols. That's another British idea. The, the Indian word is murti, but the in, Archa Vigraha is a, is a yeah, very good word, good term. The general term would be used as murti. But uh, the British gave the English translation of this as idol. And the, the, so Indian people, they say the idol, because they think they're saying the right word. But the term idol has very strongly pejorative uh, well, it is a, it's very, it is itself a very bad word because in the cr Christian tradition there's the whole, uh, thou shall not worship graven images. It's the, the, the whole story is there of how Moses went on the, on the mountain and he came back and Aaron was it? His brother, half brother. They were the people. They were all worshiping graven, a graven image of a calf, and the, and then God became angry, and Moses destroyed it. They're very much against idols. The whole Christian culture is very much against idols. The idol means you a form that is worship, a form made by man that is worshipped. But of course, the Indian or the 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 archa vigraha is not a, a man-made image as such. It is the form is made according to descriptions in Shastra and then the Lord agrees to appear as that form on the invitation of the devotee according to particular... Yeah, so that's one example that the word idol is used and Indians, even without knowing it, they, the, the offensive concept comes with that, which is also promoted by Mayavad. The idea that was, it is not really God, but because so many people pray and then it gets some potency which reflects back and, you know, so many strange ideas. Yes, please. My, my, other point, my son, uh, the people don't realize, Indian people don't realize how colonialist the New York Times is. My son sent me a front page article several years back 
Oh, that's a big thing they make about the widows in Vrindavan, yeah. Mm. Well, that's not true. That actually came from an Indian movie when our mother did a whole movie on no, yeah, the, yeah. The, the point, the point is there that there's they, they, they all the the uh, the West is extremely condescending and patronizing about India. Like we have to go there and solve their social problems, which means it's actually this book, Breaking India, makes a very good study of this. That in the name of helping and doing humanitarian work, they come in and they they take over the economy and they control the politics and uh, for, for in any small country in the world it's it maybe in China or somewhere previously but it's, it's you can't remain as a as a leader of the nation unless you're pro-american they'll they'll have you deposed or they'll they'll incite a revolution so this is all it's all part of the uh, this the meaning of Indian culture is all meant for breaking the spirit of the people and uh, bringing in McDonald's culture. That's what it's for. The fact that you know they say the women in India are so they're in such a bad condition. Well, uh, most women in India actually now the culture's changed very in the last ten years very badly. This idea of empowering women, they already have the power which men will never have, which is to have children. That's the role that God's nature gave them. Um, but still today, we can say, uh, most Indian women, they're, they're married, they're happily married, despite all the burning brides propaganda. They they uh, they don't get divorced four or five times in their life. So isn't that better than in America? There's there's real feminism is there in that that they have feminine roles. They're respected for that, whereas here in, in America the girls at age maybe twelve or thirteen average. They start off with their first of their many sexual partners throughout their lives. There's so many abortions and uh, there's no decency. There's nothing to... They, they walk around. In this summer season, you'll see them walking on with, around with very short shorts. And it's just considered normal. So, uh, I discuss many of these points in one of my books called Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life. I think we'll we'll finish there now. Oh, still some questions? Okay, yes, please. Just on the same line of idols and movie difference, uh, please clarify for me when they talk about mythology. Mythology, that's the... I was just thinking there's another term, mythology. That's another... They talk about Hindu mythology. Myth comes from the term mitya, which means false. And so Indians talk about Hindu mythology to refer to the Puranas and the Shastra, but it's not at all mythology. It's it's fact. Hmm? So how could you uh, refute the arguments when our own Indians come They use these terms. Well, that's what preaching is about, right? We have to re-educate people. We have to re-educate people. The whole education system all over the world is all bogus. It's just for making the the actual education system in India is, is or the Vedic system is meant first of all for character building. Srila Prabhupada said that's the main point, and to give people knowledge of the purpose of life. Whereas the modern education system is just to make you a slave of a system and of a mindset, which causes you to fall into lower species of life. And even in this life, to lead a completely insipid, meaningless, frustrated, 
struggle of a life. So that was another of Prabhupada's ideas. Uh, we should have our own education system. I'm completely against this modern idea in ISKCON. That we, our schools should be teach the government syllabus and have a little kirtan once a day. This is it's not going to help people. It's the, the whole the whole education and the whole mentality that goes with it is just to make people into shudras and less than. Actually, to call people shudras is a compliment because <laughs> Vedic shudras, they, had, they were following dharma. But the people are shudras in as much as they, are, they can only think of surviving if they have a job. So that's, uh, it's like a dog. You, you have to have a master, otherwise you can't exist, you can't live. Shvavriti, the livelihood of a dog. So, yes. Um, the Vaishnava Pachas, how we conduct ourselves. The Vaishnava? Upachas, how we conduct ourselves. Upacharas? Pracha. How can we dovetail? No, no, no. Um, that's where, as you started out, you were saying the root of a lot of the Hindu culture comes from Krishna, it comes from the Vaishnava Siddhanta, etc. Yeah. Right? And, mm-hmm. and many parts of the culture are derivative from that. So, how does that get separated or upgraded to actual Vaishnava Siddhanta? So, with, without the movement becoming. With Siddhanta and Acharan. Philosophical understanding and behavior are intimately related. They're not separate. So, what, can you be more specific? I don't understand what your question is. Any of the, the natural um, conduct in Hindu society has its base in, in you know, the Christian philosophy. Yeah, the conduct is the same conduct as Krishna followed so and Rama how, followed. How that is separated for the. Indian born members of our movement to where they, they rise above just what they perceive as, as their own culture to the uh, devotees who rise up to the, the platform of Vaishnava. How do you get Indians who are following this culture to become not just Hindus but Vaishnavas? Is that the point? Well, one thing I'm seeing is that many Indians nowadays they don't know anything about their traditional culture, even though it's still. Many of the points of it, they don't, that even a generation ago presented, they, still some things are there, few things are there, some reverence for sadhus, something for elders in general, some points are still there. Um, still most Indians believe in getting married. I mean, that's a very basic thing. <laughs> Uh, how to make them, bring them to the Vaishnava position? Preach. Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. We are not these bodies. We are traveling from body to body, suffering, birth and death. We have to uh, understand our eternal position in relation with Krishna. The philosophy is the same, Indian, non-Indian. Yes. The culture without Krishna consciousness is Shrama Eva Hi Kevalam. It's without Krishna, without understanding our relationship with Krishna, then it's all a waste of time. But still it's a better waste of time than the waste of time without any even slight connection, even indirectly, with Krishna. Yes, please. It seems that the, the, the difference between tradition and culture would be necessary to understand because someone may be practicing their culture just as a tradition, without, which would mean to me to be without understanding. Whereas a culture means the behavior of people according to their beliefs. <coughs> so they know why they're acting, why they're behaving the way they do. Yeah, knowledge, knowledge is required. That's the point, yeah. That's the point, yeah. That's, that word you just used, beliefs, that's a very dangerous word. That's, uh, Prabhupada would, he wouldn't accept that word. What do you believe in? It is not a belief, it is a fact. 
So this idea that religion is just something you believe in, but it has no factual basis. This Prabhupada, he didn't like that. The Christians, I, I saw some books, one of our devotees had a collection of books, all kinds of books. So I saw on the title of one of the books that there's something about helping new Christian, new believers. They, for the word Christian, they use the word believer, like the real, the, it suggested to me that among Christians to have blind faith is considered the, the main quality. <laughs> I'm a believer. That means that you, you blindly, without any intelligence, without any consideration, you blindly believe in Jesus. And that's supposed to be a good quality. But Krishna, in Bhagavad Gita, he didn't, he, he convinced Arjuna why he should act as he did. He didn't say, look, believe in me or I'm going to chuck you into hell. He, he said, understand. Shrinume Paramambacha. Again and again he tells Arjuna, listen, hear, understand. So, I just caught that word. Don't mind. Yes? You see, if I feel like watching a talk or with an interesting example of someone who was in the Indian faith culture <clears throat> and as a young man he was very interested in other things, he studied some Christian teachers. Well, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, it wasn't so much that he was interested in other things, but he and studied these other teachers. But he was actually raised with a British-style education, which was the English education was overtly British-oriented, with the uh, with the idea and the, the all young men of his age were raised uh, of in that educational system were raised with the understanding very clearly stated that Indian culture is backward and the, the British European, which specifically most importantly British culture is superior. So he was raised with that understanding. Yeah. He, uh, he studied all that in various movements like the Brahma Samaya and he became a wonderful Vaishnava and he seemed like a good example he became a Vaishnava, yeah. Of course, we understand that Bhaktivinoda Thakur is an eternal Vaishnava. Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, yeah. Much about Bhaktivinoda Thakur is misunderstood and misrepresented also. That book of Shukavak is that needs refuting. <laughs> the, yeah, anyway. Yeah, he was raised in the... Uh, that's another... Actually, that brings up another important point that when people from Hindu backgrounds take to the, the pure devotional service preached by Srila Prabhupada in the line of Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Vinod, Rupa Goswami, uh, they should, they have to be clearly educated that they, they really make the transition from being a Hindu to a pure devotee of Krishna. That's also important because they, anyone who maintains sympathy for Mayavad, which is the uh, all-pervading <laughs> in Hindu culture, almost all-pervading, then uh, they're not going. That in itself is a serious contamination. And if they maintain attachment to any part of any material culture, modern Indian culture is very much. It, it's bedeviled with this idea of becoming a success, which is completely alien to traditional Indian culture. It's a completely Western idea of becoming a success. It's, it's, uh, hmm? it's opposed to dharma. In dharma, one is supposed to perform one, one's duty as well, take training and perform it very well. In, the dharmic society is a cooperative society. The, the society based on success is a competitive society in which everyone becomes m more and more concerned simply with themselves. Uh, they don't care for their parents or even their spouse or their children or anyone else, and it just becomes more and more impersonal. <laughs> 